very much. It is wonderful to be here this evening, and thank you all for coming. I am extremely impressed with the turnout, especially on uh, a lovely evening such as this. I want you to imagine someone huddled away in darkness in a very cramped space, someone in an area which is very warm, you could say cozy, but at times even too hot, uh, someone who's invisible to the rest of the world, someone who is entirely dependent on another for their survival. Someone who requires a narrow, long cord to give them their sustenance and nourishment to ensure their survival. As you imagine someone in circumstances like this, who comes to mind? What's that? The, the unborn child. Well, that's not who I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm thinking of these 33 men. Who are they? They are the Chilean, Chilean miners who one year ago, last month, August of 2010, were working in their mine when 700,000 tons of rock collapsed on it. They were trapped 600 meters below the surface of the earth, and their experience in that moment was in some sense very similar to the experience of the preborn child. In darkness, a warm area, invisible to the rest of the world, entirely dependent on someone else for their survival. Like birth, uh, they even had to navigate a very narrow passageway to get to the surface. Now, unlike birth, where a children, or parents wait in anticipation at the arrival of their children, children were waiting with anticipation at the arrival of their parents, shouting or crying tears of joy. When our world recognized innocent human beings were trapped and in need of help, the response unanimously was one of rushing to their aid. We recognized their dignity, we recognized their worth, and with that came the responsibility to protect and respect their lives. And yet if you look at our world's response to the preborn child who are in a similar set, preborn children who are in a similar set of circumstances as the minors, our world's response to the preborn child is very different from how our world responded to the minors. Not only does our world uh, ignore and abandon the preborn children, we actually directly and intentionally kill preborn children through the act of abortion. Can we even fathom abandoning those minors as they were stuck below the surface of the earth? Can we fathom directly and intentionally blowing up the area that they were trapped in? We can't. And yet, that's what happens day in and day out. Our society directly and intentionally dismembers, decapitates, and disembowels the bodies of children. Why the double standard? Why do we protect the lives of the minors and abandon the lives of preborn children? Well, as I have talked to many abortion advocates over the 11 years that I've been public speaking and nine years that I've been doing pro-life work full time, Time and again in conversation, what I find is those who support abortion generally deny the humanity or the value of the preborn child. And so, in fact, some people would look at the analogy I just made to the minors and the preborn and say, well, there's a problem with your analogy. Minors are human beings, fetuses aren't. They're potential humans, they're non-persons. That's why abortion's okay, that's why we would never kill the minors. So when it comes to articulating the pro-life perspective, the key question that needs to be answered is, are the preborn valuable human beings like the Chilean miners? And if they are valuable human beings, just like the Chilean miners, then just as we protect and respect their lives, we need to protect and respect the lives of preborn children. In order to illustrate the point that the central question in any discussion on abortion is, are the preborn valuable humans, like the miners, like you and me, Let's look for a moment at the many circumstances a pregnant woman can be in that could prompt some people to say abortion is justified. We're going to kind of throw all those circumstances out tonight, and then I'm going to look at each circumstance and show how, by uh, making an analogy or a comparison to another issue, we can redirect the discussion away from the circumstances of an unplanned pregnancy and onto the question of when does life begin, are the preborn human? So what are some of the circumstances used by some in society to justify abortion? Rape. People will say the woman's conceived as a result of sexual assault. What other circumstances are often provided to justify abortion? 
life of the mother if she, uh, her life is in danger. What other circumstances? Overpopulation. Too many people, people will say, so abortion is the solution. What else? Incest. Incest. Poverty, can't afford the child. Quality of life, the life just isn't going to have a good standard of living. It's a girl. It's a girl, that's right. That's right, gender side. If you look at the many varied circumstances, and I didn't read all of your minds, so I didn't get them all captured on this little bubble here. But if you look at the many varied circumstances, some people will say, you know, abortion isn't always right, it's not always wrong. We determine the morality of it on a case-by-case -case basis. And if a woman's circumstances are difficult enough, then sometimes abortion is justified. Whereas what I'm going to argue tonight is that the morality of abortion is not determined by the individual circumstances of the pregnant woman, but rather is determined by answering the question, are the preborn valuable human beings like you and me? And the way to prove that, the centrality of that question, is to ask ourselves, in all of these circumstances, if we were dealing with an infant, would we ever justify the ending of that infant's life for any of those reasons? Because the mother of the child is poor, or the mother doesn't want the child, or the quality of that child's life is not good, or the child was conceived and raped. In any of those circumstances, would we kill the child pictured there? And we would not. So then we simply ask, why then would it be okay to kill that child for those circumstances? And someone may say, because that's not a child yet, and that infant is. And the moment you get that kind of reaction, that reinforces my point that the central question in the abortion debate is, is that a child when we're dealing with someone who is not yet born? Is it a human being like an infant? So let's take some of these specifically, take the situation of rape. The analogy I'll often use to redirect the discussion away from how someone was conceived onto what was conceived is the following. Let's say you're dealing with a woman who was raped a day after having sex with her husband. So that in one month's time, when she discovers she's pregnant, she doesn't know who the father of her child is. It could be the husband, it could be the rapist. So let's say she hopes it's her husband's child. She carries on with the pregnancy, and after the baby is born, a paternity test is done. The results come back and reveal the father of the child is not her husband, it's the rapist. Now that I've used that analogy, I end with a question. Would our society ever allow that woman or anyone to kill the newborn child because of the father's crime. And even those who support abortion will say, no, of course not. So then we simply ask, if we won't kill the newborn child because of the father's crime, why the preborn child? That's different, someone may say. Fetuses aren't people yet. So then the real question is, are fetuses people? Now some people may say, well, that's a far-fetched analogy, like that would ever happen. Well, a couple of years ago, the New York Times interviewed this abortionist, Dr. Wickland. And she was sharing all her many experiences being an abortionist, and I was struck by one comment in the article in which Dr. Wickland describes her horror when she aborted the pregnancy of a woman who had been raped, only to discover after examining the removed tissue that the pregnancy was further along than she or the woman had thought, and that she just aborted an embryo, the woman and her husband conceived together. Even the abortionist was horrified. But if it's horrifying to kill a child conceived in love, is it not equally horrifying to kill a child conceived in violence if in both situations we're dealing with a child? And so the real question is, are the preborn human? Take the circumstance of poverty. There are born people who are poor. When we see images like this, we don't send money so that they are killed. We send money so that they are provided with food and shelter and the things that they need to survive. If we don't kill born people for reasons of poverty, why the preborn? Someone may say, again, I'm comparing apples to oranges because the preborn aren't the same as the born, so then that's the question, are they? Or take the health of the child, disability. Over 90% of Down syndrome diagnoses end in abortion. Over 90%. And yet we have to look at campaigns like this one by the Down Syndrome Society, which has advertisements like this on billboards in BC and Alberta. And we have to ask ourselves, would we kill this little girl because she has Down Syndrome? And if we wouldn't kill her now because she has Down Syndrome, then why before birth? 
Well, someone may say because she's an individual living human being right now, and before birth, she wasn't in existence yet. So then the real question is, when did we first come into existence? So I'd like to answer that now and equip you to be able to answer that question. And when dialoguing about abortion, I have found three tactics, you could say, or approaches for conversation that are particularly helpful when it comes to being persuasive. You want to ask questions, you want to tell stories, and you want to illustrate your point. And I've already been making use of the first two. I've been asking questions and telling stories or using analogies as I'm getting my points across. And I'm going to illustrate uh, one of my points in answering the question, when does life begin, by beginning with a timeline. Let's say we're dealing with a 20-year-old, and we want to determine when in the timeline of this 20-year-old's life the individual first came into existence. Well, we know 20 years prior, birth occurred. And we know nine months prior to birth, fertilization occurred. Now, there are several things scientifically we know about the process of fertilization. The first is that if you have human parents, what comes into existence at fertilization must also be human. We know that being must be of the same species because of the scientific principle which says living things come from other uh, living things as well as life begets life. So living things reproduce after their own kind. You can say dogs produce dogs, cats cats, and humans produce humans. So we know we're dealing with something of the same species as its parents. We also know that individual has all the genetic information distinguishing him or her from everyone else. Her hair, color, eye color, all that genetic material, particularly distinguishing the individual from her parents, that is determined at fertilization. We also know at fertilization the individual is alive, as I said a moment ago, because living things come from other living things. Now, if someone is thinking about that statement, then they may say, well, if living things come from other living things, and the being at fertilization is alive, then that must mean the things it came from are also alive. The sperm and the egg from which the zygote came are alive. Are you saying sperm and egg by themselves are equal to zygotes? Well, this fourth point is very important. At fertilization, the being we're dealing with is a whole human as opposed to a part of a human. A sperm or an egg by themselves are much like my hand or my foot in that they're human parts. But once the sperm fertilizes the egg, no longer do we have human parts, but a whole human being who has everything she needs within herself to move to the next more mature stage of human development. We're dealing with not a potential human at fertilization, but a human with great potential. There's an excellent article I recommend you look for on the internet called When Does Human Life Begin? A Scientific Perspective. It's written by Dr. Maureen Condon, who's a professor of neurobiology and anatomy. And she makes a phenomenal scientific case for life beginning at fertilization. And in particular, she makes the case for life beginning at the beginning of the process of fertilization. Because if you know anything about fertilization, you know it takes some time. It takes about 24 or so hours uh, for the process to complete. And Dr. Condit makes the case for life beginning at the beginning point of those 24 hours in what she calls sperm egg fusion. And she is able to establish that what we're dealing with at fertilization is in fact a whole human as opposed to a part of a human by looking at how scientists distinguish different cell types. She says, if you want to know how one cell is different from another cell, you look at two things. You look at what the cell is composed of, and you look at the behavior of that cell. And she says, by looking at cellular composition and, may and behavior, we can determine that the sperm and the egg by themselves are radically different from what comes into existence when the sperm fertilizes the egg. The composition of the sperm is the genetic material from only the father. The composition of the egg is the genetic material from only the mother. But the composition of the zygote, that newly conceived being, even in the one cell stage, the composition is the genetic material from both the mother and the father. Even prior to the chromosomes intermingling, all the material is nonetheless contained in that one cell, unlike the sperm and the egg by themselves. So that's one indicator that we're dealing with a different kind of cell. Secondly, behavior. The behavior of a sperm is to find an egg and fertilize it. The behavior of an egg is to sit and wait for penetration. But the behavior of a zygote is fundamentally different. The moment of sperm egg fusion, the moment one sperm penetrates that egg, that zygote acts to prevent sperm from penetrating it. So the behavior of that cell 
is fundamentally different. And from that point forward, that being changes what she or he looks like and changes what she or he is able to do, but doesn't change who he or she is. The identity of each of us began not before fertilization, not after fertilization, but at fertilization. Once gave a talk to a group of uh, grade seven students, I asked them what this was and they said a printer. <laughs> I said, no, it's a Polaroid camera. Can anyone tell me what that is? But these kids, even though they were very used to digital cameras, did know what a Polaroid camera was. And so I think a Polaroid camera can actually reinforce the point that life begins at uh, fertilization with the following story. Imagine you're on vacation, let's say you uh, are in Scotland where my dad is from, right? So you go to Scotland one day and you go to a very famous lake known as Loch Ness. Now what's in Loch Ness? Monster. Of course. You know, my grandma swears she saw it. So anyways, you're on a boat, you're on Loch Ness, you're with a friend, and you turn to your right and two arms lengths away there is none other than the Loch Ness Monster. And so you grab the only camera you have, which happens to be a Polaroid camera, and you snap a photo of Nessie, all those humps and bumps sticking out of the water, and you think now you will be able to prove to the world what people thought was a myth is actually reality. And just as you snap the photo, and just as that little card comes out, Nessie goes underwater. Well, you don't care, because you have all the proof you need, you'll sell the picture to newspapers, you'll make a whole bunch of money, now, your friend is in the boat with you, has never seen a Polaroid camera. And so she excitedly grabs the card to look at the photo you just took. But she doesn't see an image there. All she sees are brown smudges, because of course, you know, you gotta wave, shake it a bit, and wait for the image to appear. So your friend, not knowing how Polaroid cameras work, thinks the photo didn't take. And with great disappointment, tosses it into Loch Ness and says, I can't believe the photo didn't work. Now, would you be angry that your friend just tossed the photo into the lake? I know I would be. Your photo's just destroyed. Now imagine if getting angry at your friend for what she just did, she responded, but it was just brown smudges. What do you care about brown smudges for? You'd likely reply, it wasn't just brown smudges. Everything about the image of the Loch Ness Monster was captured in an instant. It just needed time to develop. And the same can be said about each one of us and who we are today. Literally, we were captured in that instant of sperm egg fusion, the beginning of the process of fertilization. We just needed time to develop. At this point, what I'd like to do is play for you a phenomenal film about prenatal development. I'm only going to play a several minute clip. It's called The Biology of Prenatal Development. You can get it from National Geographic or the website ehd.org, if you're taking notes, as some of you are, ehd.org. And what makes this video set apart from all other prenatal development videos I've seen is that it makes use of very rare technology, embryoscopy and fetoscopy, which were very tiny cameras inserted in utero to basically introduce us to the world of the preborn child. So whereas most people have only ever seen ultrasound, this film makes use of actual video footage. A touch to the mouth area causes the embryo to reflexively withdraw its head. The external ear is beginning to take shape. By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen, along with a startle response. The four-chambered heart is largely complete. On average, the heart now beats 167 times per minute. Electrical activity of the heart, recorded at seven and a half weeks, reveals a wave pattern similar to the adults. In females, the ovaries are identifiable by seven weeks. Fingers are separate.
and toes are joined only at the bases. The hands can now come together, as can the feet. Knee joints are also present. By eight weeks, 75% of embryos exhibit right hand dominance. The remainder is equally divided between left-handed dominance and no preference. This is the earliest evidence of right or left-handed behaviour. Head rotation, neck extension and hand-to-face contact occur more often. Touching the embryo elicits squinting. Jaw movement. Grasping motions and toe pointing. Between seven and eight weeks, the upper and lower eyelids rapidly grow over the eyes and partially fuse together. Although there is no air in the uterus, the embryo displays intermittent breathing motions by eight weeks. So as you can see, it's phenomenal how rapidly that preborn child is growing and developing in utero. And yet some people may still persist in justifying abortion by saying, even if it's of the same species as us, there are some pretty significant differences between life before birth and life after. And as a, as a result of those differences, that's why we may have abortions, but may not kill born individuals, be they toddlers, infants, or the Chilean minors. So what are those differences? If we were to kind of summarize some of the differences between life before birth and life after, what would they be? Breathing. Breathing, that's right. They breathe, they obtain oxygen through the umbilical cord as opposed to the lungs being functional. Yeah? What else? Can they feel pain? Yes? No? Yes. Well, at some point they can, but that's being debated. Some people will, uh, I've seen some studies that say, you know, between 9 and 13 and a half weeks, and other studies say no, not until after 20 weeks. I think it's safe to say they're not able to feel pain at fertilization. So there's that difference. What else? Size. Size. They're simply significantly smaller than the rest of us. Mm. Obviously, they can't reason. Yes? Yeah, they would be the attachment to the mother and total reliance on her body for survival. If you take the, the differences between life before birth and life after, they fall into one of four categories. There's the difference of size, the difference of their development, both physical and mental, their environment, and their dependency. And some people will argue that the preborn may be aborted for some or all of these differences. But if you look at life after birth, let's say an infant compared to a 20-year-old, and ask yourself, are there any differences? Indeed, those same four differences exist after birth as they do before. So we have to ask ourselves, would we ever permit someone to kill an infant on the grounds that, well, it's not an adult, so therefore it's smaller and less developed? Of course not. Then why allow someone to justifiably kill, or to justify killing a preborn child on the grounds that, well, it's smaller and, and less developed than someone who's born. Oopsie. Uh, my colleague found a fantastically hilarious book on parenting called The Do's and Don'ts of Parenting, which essentially is a picture book of things you should and shouldn't do. And I think several of the pictures from this book kind of reinforce my point that our value and our right to life shouldn't be based on any of uh, those differences, size, development, environment, or dependency. And so this is one of the sections from the book. And of course, we would never say that the child is invaluable or that the child may be killed because her size prevents her or him from exercising in a certain way. Well, in the same way, a preborn child is much smaller but is nonetheless just as valuable as a born child. Then there is level of development. And some children, due to their age, do not have the cognitive abilities to do the things adults can do. It doesn't mean we may kill them. And correspondingly, the preborn child is intellectually far underdeveloped compared to the rest of us. It doesn't mean we may kill them. There are certain environments we just won't survive in. It doesn't mean it's okay to kill us. And the preborn child, or even a born child born pre premature, requires a certain environment, and if taken out of that environment and put in another one, will not survive. 
If it's wrong to kill an infant who cannot, you know, keep themselves alive underwater the way we could by holding our breaths, or although some babies of certain ages actually do know how to hold their breaths. But anyways, you get my point. Uh, correspondingly, we shouldn't deny the pre-born child her right to life just because she can only live in one environment and not another. Dependency, we're going to go from comical to more serious now. Uh, some people argue that it's the dependency of the child on the mother's body that justifies abortion. And my question is, when someone is more dependent than someone else, does that lessen our responsibility towards them or heighten our responsibility towards them? I'm going to put up a graphic image uh, warning you. It's, it's graphic. <clears throat> I was standing in the streets of Vancouver several years ago with this sign. And a woman walked past and began speaking with me and told me that she was from Rwanda and most of her family had been killed in the genocide. And as I was holding that picture, I became really self-conscious. And I thought, oh boy, what does she think about me for making this comparison? So I asked her, I said, how do you feel about this comparison? She looked in silence at this image, and after about 20 seconds, she pointed to the picture of the aborted baby, and she said, that's worse, because at least my family could try to run away. That woman recognized the greater someone's weakness, the greater their vulnerability, the greater their dependency, that does not lessen our responsibility towards them. It heightens our responsibility towards them. So yes, the pre-born child is far more dependent than you or I are depending on someone else, but all the more reason to care for them. In short, I would say that is a basic presentation of the pro-life perspective. I didn't tell you the heart starts beating at three weeks. I didn't tell you brain waves can be detected at six weeks. Because those things don't really matter. You can be ignorant about a lot of little details about prenatal development. You could know nothing about fetal pain. But those things don't matter. The morality of abortion is, is as simple as knowing when does life begin and being able to make that basic presentation of the scientific facts of life beginning at fertilization, and then using some basic philosophy to say, look, just because one human differs from another human in their size or their development, doesn't mean we can kill each other. In fact, if you think about those differences, size, level of development, environment, and dependency, all of them ultimately boil down to one thing, age. The preborn are smaller than us because of how old they are. A toddler is more dependent than an adult because of how old she is. The preborn are in the mother's bodies because in our species, at that age, that's where you need to be to grow and develop. Ultimately, I would say the abortion debate boils down to age discrimination. Because the only reason they can't do and act and think like you and me is because of how old they are. And so we really have to ask our society, why should those of us who are older have a right to kill those who are younger. As I've talked to many people about abortion, it has occurred to me in recent conversations that I'm trying to talk to people about what's right and wrong. And they'll often bring up things I've already brought up. Well, what about rape? You know, what if the child's got a disability? What if the, the, the child's life is going to be difficult? What if your life is going to be difficult? And it's occurred to me what they're saying back to me is along the lines of not what's right versus wrong, but what's easy versus hard. Is it going to be easy to carry a pregnancy to term when that pregnancy was a result of rape? Of course not. Is it going to be easy to parent a child when you don't have family support and you're poor? Of course not. It's going to be really difficult. And because it's really difficult, that's why abortion will, people will often default to saying abortion is okay. And the challenge for pro-life people is that we can't necessarily make it easy. We can't say to the rape victim, oh, well, you know, it's, it's actually going to be easy. Because it won't be. We can't change it from being hard. We can try to make it a little less hard. But it's still going to be really difficult. 
So as I've been kind of reflecting on this, thinking, well, gosh, how then can I get people to do the right thing if doing the right thing is so difficult? And so I began a little non-scientific experiment. I started asking people I was talking to, and I started asking my audiences in now multiple countries, multiple continents. I had asked people from all over the world, who inspires them? And once someone tells me who inspires them, who has the ability to, to positively influence how they think and how they feel, someone who, who encourages, them, encourages them in some way by their example, by their life, who inspires them? If I have asked, as I have asked countless people that question, I always get a different answer for who, but I've noticed a common theme for why person X or person Y inspires us. And the common trend I've noticed as I've asked this question of many people, or these two questions, is that people who inspire us do hard things. People who inspire us, they face hardship. They face suffering. They face obstacles. And what sets those who inspire apart from those who don't, is not the difficulties that they face or don't face, but how they respond to the difficulties they face. They don't give up. They don't give in. They rise above. They look at an obstacle and they turn it into an opportunity. People who are inspiring, heroes of great causes, the kind of people that books are written about them and movies are made about them, people like Mother Teresa or Gandhi or Dr. King, the kind of people who inspire put others first, often at the expense of their comfort, their convenience, perhaps even their lives. They care more about the other than they care about themselves. They know the definition of love, which is, what is to want the other's good. And as I, I have asked people who inspires them, and they tell me these amazing individuals who have done incredible things, I then say to them, it seems to me you're positively impacted and totally drawn in by an individual who did the right thing even though it was really hard to do. So in the circumstance you're talking about, about an unplanned pregnancy, maybe conception as a result of rape, maybe you can follow in the example of the individual you told me inspires you, and you can do the right thing even though it's the hard thing. You can put the other before yourself. I'd like to play for you a very inspiring video of two individuals who uh, certainly have the ability to positively influence how we think and how we feel. And when this video is done, I'm going to talk about how we can take their example and apply it to the pro-life message. Registration for the 25th Ironman continues one by one. Some faces we recognize. Here is 58-year-old Richard Holcomb, number 214, back for a second try. He's legally blind and it doesn't matter to him. No, the...
said, forget Rick. Put him away, put him in an institution. He's going to be nothing but a vegetable for the rest of his life. We cried a little bit. We talked, and we said, no, we're not going to put Rick away. We're going to bring Rick home and bring him up like any other child. We knew Rick was smart. We could tell by looking in his eyes. And when we talked to him, we, you know, he was paying attention to what we were saying. So we wanted to get a computer built so Rick could communicate with us. Everybody came to our house that night for Rick to say his first words. And everybody was betting, you know, what is the first words Rick is ever going to say? His mom saying, it's going to be, hi, mom. And me, the dad, saying, oh, it's going to be, hi, dad. Well, the Boston Bruins were going for the Stanley Cup. And the very first words Rick ever said was, go Bruins. Dick is a military man, so he knows a thing or two about commitment. This time, he's just months removed from a heart attack. This gift that he gives to his son, or is it the other way around? Either way, it all started when Rick heard about a charity run for a paralyzed athlete. He asked Dad, and Dad said yes. and everybody thought that Rick and I would just go to the corner and turn around and come back. Well, we didn't. We finished the whole five miles coming in next to last, but not last. And when we got home that night, Rick wrote on his computer, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. So that was a very powerful message to me that we finally found a sport that Rick could get involved in just like everybody else.
pushing someone in a wheelchair. And yet that's what Dick Hoyt managed to do. He did hard things. He loved the other. And he found his hope and his fulfillment in that. And that's the mystery of love. When we lose sight of ourselves and instead focus on the other, that's where we find our happiness. And so, yes, you can has got to be our message to that woman with the unplanned pregnancy. It may be really difficult, but you can do it. Yes, you can. By following in the example of inspiring people like Ricky and Dick Hoyt. up to questions, what I'd like to do is talk about what you do with this information. Because I don't like wasting my time. And if you have come here and heard me speak for, you know, 40 or so minutes, and you leave here unchanged by what I've said, and do nothing different in your life, then I've wasted my time. It is my expectation that by what is imparted to you tonight, that you leave here changed. And to be changed means that you don't just feel differently, that you don't just think differently, but that you act differently, that you respond to the plight of the preborn child through action, the way the world responded to the plight of the minors through action, by making decisions and choices which saved those men's lives. The St. Gerard Magella Group, which has invited me here, has started a very uh, phenomenal campaign, specifically targeting the Every Woman's Abortion Clinic to shut it down through prayer and fasting. And as we know from the scriptures, some demons can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. And I would say that whatever action we do, the foundation of it should be prayer. And in fact, a phenomenal book along those lines that I recommend is called The Soul of the Apostolate. The Soul of the Apostolate. It, its premise is, the more active you are, the more in the world you are, the more you're doing good, the more you need to pray. And if you don't pay attention to that, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So any action we take must be on that foundation of prayer, which this group is focusing on. But from that prayer needs to spring forth action. So when it comes to different actions that we can do, or different messagings that we can get across, we need to look at the pro-life cause as like a big toolbox. And in that toolbox are a lot of different tools, because different tools are needed for different things. You need the wrench, you need the hammer, you need the screwdriver, and they do different things. And because we live in a world with so many unique individuals, different messages will reach different people. And so we need to look at the pro-life toolbox as having a lot of different things which are all needed to get the message out. And if you could take the different pro-life messaging and, and summarize them, they generally can fall into three categories. There's the message that the pre-born are human, an activity is, is associated with getting that message out. The message that abortion kills the pre-born, and activities associated with that. And the message that abortion wounds the born, most specifically women who have had abortions, but also men and the rest of society which uh, are, are feeling the effects of the loss of these children. So these are the three different angles that we could come from, and I would say we need to have a holistic approach. We need to have all of those messages. But I will say my experience in being very active in the pro-life movement, not just for this past decade, but really my whole life because I was a child activist, uh, my parents would bring my sister and I from Chilliwack to Vancouver specifically to protest outside the Every Woman's Abortion Clinic. So uh, I go way back in, in terms of my pro-life activism, and, and I would say that my observation has been the movement is very comfortable about talking about number three, and comfortable about talking about number one, but we're often really uncomfortable talking about number two. If we're going to take an action which involves exposing abortion for the evil that it is, a lot of people kind of want to avoid really dealing with the nitty-gritty because it makes us uncomfortable. But we need to keep in mind, abortion isn't wrong because it hurts women. Abortion is wrong because it kills children. And because it kills children, it hurts women. 
Because it kills children, it hurts women physically because our bodies were designed to carry a pregnancy to term, not have it unnaturally, prematurely ended. Because it kills children, it hurts women emotionally and spiritually and psychologically because it goes against our nature to kill our offspring. But we mustn't confuse the effects of abortion with the fundamental reason why it's wrong. So when it comes to things you can do, I'm going to talk more about number two, only because there's really no debate about number one and number three. Holistic messaging, that's what we want. This is the, the team with my organization, CCBR. We want to take the beauty of the preborn child, we want to contrast it with the ugliness of abortion, and then we want to have the witness of women who have been there, done that, and regret it. And what's powerful about this is that we're not stating conclusions at people. We're not telling them abortion kills children. We're proving abortion kills children. We're not merely telling them abortion hurts women. We're proving abortion hurts women with the woman who shares her testimony. What I'm going to do now is play for you a brief video that I hope you will use as a tool in that toolbox to convince people you know about abortion. And in particular, I would like you to think in the next 48 hours, who is someone you know that you can sit down with and go online and play the video for them that I'm about to play for you, saying to them, I went to this talk the other night, and this woman was speaking about abortion, and I was wondering, what do you think about abortion? Start the conversation, ask a lot of questions, use analogies, and then when the conversation gets to that point where you can illustrate your point, ask them, would you be interested in hopping online and watching something with me that this uh, woman showed in her presentation? The video is graphic, and that's because abortion is graphic. The video is disgusting, because killing a baby is a disgusting thing. And we're going to see what happened today, and will happen tomorrow. And we have to ask ourselves, in a moment of deep self-reflection, if there was a clinic, or two, or three, set up in this city, where toddlers were being taken and killed, today and tomorrow, would we be responding to that the way we're responding to this? Now certainly when we show the truth, we need to be merciful and distinguish condemning an action with condemning a person. We condemn the act, we don't condemn the person. We offer hope and mercy to anyone who has been involved with abortion. And, and a great example of, of the transformation God does when we go to him with a repentant heart is to look at John Newton, the former slave ship owner who composed the song Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He realized what he did. He repented of it. And God turned him into a phenomenal pastor who was a mentor to William Wilberforce, who was key in bringing about the end of the slave trade.
it. Thank you. My colleague Greg Cunningham has said, injustice that is invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. And what we just saw is being tolerated in our society precisely because it's hidden. It's hidden behind the closed doors of abortion clinics. It's hidden behind rhetoric like choice. But injustice that is made visible inevitably becomes intolerable. So what can you do? I implore you to get involved with the group, the St. Gerard Magella group, witnessing outside the abortion clinic. And I implore the group to witness with a holistic message. The preborn child in her beautiful state, abortion in its ugly state, and post-abortive women giving testimony. Incorporate that holistic message by exposing the injustice of abortion. And I'll end with the three objections people have to that and how to address them. Some say it's not effective, some say it just makes people angry, and some say, but what about the post-abortive woman? In terms of it being ineffective, this is a little baby named Adrian, who was in his mother's womb one year ago almost to the day when she was scheduled for an abortion. An organization was standing in the streets of Calgary with graphic images near the Latino Festival. Not because the Latino Festival is pro-abortion, because it's not, but because it's a gathering with large numbers of people and we wanted to be where large numbers of people were. And Adrian's mother walked past and saw our team and just kept walking, but what was on her mind was that she was scheduled to do what she suddenly just saw. And the next day, it was raining, and she saw the team again, and she, she felt as though they were following her, as though, like, how do they know? And in this pouring rain, one of our, my colleagues went up to her, not knowing that she was pregnant, and saying what well, we always say to people, what do you think about abortion, and offered her a pamphlet. And she just kind of took the pamphlet and walked away, but that night she, she remembered the pictures, and she remembered those, that man's eyes staring out at her with a wet face, standing, witnessing in the rain. She canceled her appointment. Baby Adrian was born this past spring. We also recently learned of a little girl in Calgary who's 15 months old, because her mom saw a graphic image we had on display when she was 12 weeks pregnant and thinking about the possibility of abortion. And when she saw the images, she thought, I can't do that. She carried her pregnancy to term, had her baby, and she didn't tell us. The only reason we found out that story is she happened to run into our team protesting on the streets. You know, funny, with these signs, because, and then she told her story. So it saves lives. What about uh, the fact that uh, people will get angry? Some people will conclude, if they preach a message and an individual gets angry, that they're inst they instantly conclude they're doing something right. And other people would conclude in the face of hostility, well, then I must be doing something wrong. And I would say you can't draw either conclusion until you first ask yourself a question. Why are they angry at me? And the answer to the question why will determine whether you should persist or whether you should cease your behavior. If you answer the question, why are they angry at me with, I guess I'm being unchristlike, I'm really mean, I'm angry, I'm a charitable, I'm disrespectful, then you need to change what you're doing. But if the answer to the question, why are they angry at me, is I've communicated a message that's hitting a chord with them because of a choice they've made or a choice they're about to make, and this information is making it difficult for them to go down that path, then we need to be willing to take the heat in order for lives to be saved. Heroes that we celebrate today were typically despised when they lived and faced with a lot of hostility. Jesus made people so angry he was crucified. Thomas Clarkson, who worked very closely with William Wilberforce to bring about the abolition of the slave trade, made people so angry that they had death threats for him. They attempted to attack him. Alice Paul, suffragette who fought for women's right to vote, made people so angry when she went on a hunger strike that the workers at the jailhouse force fed her. Hans and Sophie Scholl, a brother and sister who were university students during the time of the Second World War, made the Nazis so angry with their action of distributing leaflets, which called the Nazis out for their human rights violations, that the Nazis beheaded them. Dr. King made people so angry that 
He was arrested close to 23 times, assaulted four times, his house was bombed, and he was eventually assassinated. Social reformers are often not liked when they're alive. We only begin to appreciate them when they're dead. As my colleague Greg has also said, effective reformers are rarely liked, and liked reformers are rarely effective. So what about the post-abortive woman, the third and final objection? We certainly, as I said before the film, need to have mercy and compassion in our hearts. But it's important to bear in mind that we cannot have love without truth. And if we love people, then that means we share truth messages with them which will set them free, even if they're difficult to accept. It's also important that we be able to distinguish triggers from trauma. Some people will look at graphic images on display and say, you're traumatizing women. No, we're not. But we are triggering the trauma that's gone on. There was a woman in Calgary who years back had an abortion. And after her abortion, she went home with her boyfriend. And she went upstairs to have a nap, and he went downstairs and played her piano. Now, this particular girl was a phenomenal piano player. Shortly after that, the sight of the piano was so bothersome to her that she sold her piano and stopped playing the piano, and her family couldn't understand, you're so good, how come you're not even touching the instrument anymore? She eventually went to post-abortion counseling, and it came out that piano became a trigger for the trauma of the abortion. She associated the piano and the music with what had happened that day because he was playing while she was napping post-procedure. The sight of a pregnant woman is a trigger for someone who's had an abortion. That could have been me. That should have been me. The sight of a six-month-old child is a trigger for someone who's endured the trauma of abortion. My child will be six months old today. When people are triggered by a trauma, the solution is not to eliminate triggers. We can't rid the world of pregnant women and six-month-old children because those individuals happen to be triggers to post-abortive women of the abortions that they had. We have to use that as a ministering opportunity to bring to the surface what the real problem is and help them find healing. We need to help them achieve a healthy response to triggers, not run from triggers. Last summer, our team was standing in the streets with signs like this, and my job the day this photo was taken was to hand out pamphlets, not have a sign on me, and ask passers-by what they think. And a woman stepped off the crosswalk right to the edge of the sidewalk, and this is exactly what she saw. And she was just staring in silence. So I approached her, and I said, what do you think about abortion? And her response was to, to just describe what she was looking at. She said, oh my gosh. It has ribs and fingers. I said, yeah, that's just in the first trimester when a majority of abortions happen. And tears began to well up in her eyes. And I was concerned that she had probably had an abortion. And our way of trying to draw that out of someone in order to create a ministering opportunity is to ask them if they know anyone who's had an abortion. And so I asked her, and she simply nodded her head. And I said, I know people as well. And then she turned, she said, I have to go, and she bolted down the sidewalk. I went to Anita, my friend, holding the I regret my abortion sign, and I asked her for one of her business cards that has a toll-free number that women can call for counseling. And I ran down the street after her, and I said, excuse me, excuse me. And she stopped and turned around, and I said, I just wanted to give you this card for your friends. If any of them feel they need someone to talk to or listen about the abortion that they've had, this number will help them. And at that point, the tears that had welled up in her eyes had just, they were pouring over. And so I very gently said to her, did you have one? And she said, yes. And I said, may I hug you? And she said, yes. And I said, I am sorry for your loss. And then she said to me, nobody told me it looked like that. 
She killed her baby four months earlier because nobody told her it looked like that. And so her sin became our sin. And maybe even more so because she acted out of ignorance. But if we know and we withhold, then the blood is on our hands. The great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its pus-flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, so too injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. So what can you do? Get involved with the group and witness on the streets. Our website, unmaskingchoice.ca, has a list of other things you can do. It says get active in the drop-down menu. We'll give suggestions like put a bumper sticker in your car, take our pro-life leaflets, and every time you're in a public place, leave them on the bathroom counter at the mall, leave them on the bus bench, uh, leave them at the doctor's office. Uh, things like uh, getting involved with the pro-life group. Every, well not everyone, but most of you, uh, there's a little white card on the chairs you were sitting on. If you want to stay involved or stay in touch with us, find out what we're doing and the projects that we'll be developing here in Vancouver over the, over the next year, because we're going to be doing some activities here, please fill that out and leave it on the table where our literature is, and we'll make sure that we stay in touch with you. But there's no shortage of things you can do, and the website has an extensive list. When the 11th miner was brought to the surface, he looked at the president of Chile and he said, thank you for believing that we were alive. Will the day come where one day you come face to face with someone whose life was in danger of abortion? Someone who never was aborted because you believed they were alive. Your actions will determine whether that day happens. What you do when you leave this room, who you talk to, who you're willing to share this information with, all of that will determine whether the moment ever comes in this life or the next where one or many people will look you in the eye and to you specifically will say, Thank you for believing that we were alive. I am hopeful by your presence here tonight that you will encounter those individuals because you will leave, to leave here with a deep conviction that will lead you to action. Thank you and God bless.